Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we come to Thee once more. We thank Thee, O Lord, for every moving and prompting within us that urges us to turn to Thee. We pray that this may increase, that we may realize more and more our dependence upon Thee. We know that we live and move and have our being in Thee, that we would be more and more conscious of this and realize that apart from Thee we can finally do nothing. So, o Lord, we pray Thee to look upon us and to be gracious unto us, to grant us a sense of Thy presence, and above all to grant us that unction <coughs> and anointing of the Holy Spirit, that our minds, being enlightened and our understandings quickened, we may learn <coughs> to differentiate between these things that differ and we may lay hold on that which is true and profitable, so that in all things, and especially in any ministry thou hast called us unto to exercise in thy name, we may do it in a manner that shall be well-pleasing in thy sight, a manner that thou canst bless and honor. Hear us then, O Lord, as we commend ourselves to thee in our consideration of these matters once more. Receive our humble and unworthy prayers, and pardon and forgive us, for all the defects and imperfections of our service and our every sin. For we ask it all, pleading nothing but the name and the merit of thy dear Son, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well now, or oh, perhaps before I resume what I'd... Uh, what I'm going to say, I ought to announce perhaps that I hope that next time, next Monday, I will have finished uh, what I've got to say from my side so that it will leave us with at least two full sessions for questions and discussion uh, next week. Uh, the question does arise and has been raised with me also of whether there is to be an examination. Uh, you know my views on that. I've given them to you. But representations have been made to me to the effect that it would be advantageous for those who have chosen this course if there is an examination. Well, who am I to decide? Uh, I want to do what would be advantageous to you. <laughs> <laughs> but there are probably two opinions as to that. So all I can say at the moment is that I will consider this again and listen to the two sides separately and perhaps together. I Quite seriously, I, of course, don't believe in these examinations, but if, if you are going to suffer or to lose something by not taking them, well then I've got to submit and I'm ready to do so. But I must first be convinced that that is the case. All right, we'll leave it at that for the moment. Well now, we've uh, come to this uh, point at which we've... Uh, dealt with the various aspects of uh, preaching and uh, whether we end with an appeal or not. We seem to have looked in general at this act of preaching, this thing which takes place when people gather together and a man who claims to have been called of God to do this has done so. So now the next question I think that arises is the question of repeating the same sermon. Um, I've got to raise this question because uh, you'll soon find that it uh, arises uh, in your ministry, whether you've ever thought of it or whether you've actually done it or not so far. And uh, there is uh, an element of problem in this. I find that there are some Christian people who are surprised that a preacher should repeat a sermon they seem to think that this is almost sinful. So I think we need to look into this and to examine it. Now, when I talk about repeating a sermon, I obviously am not thinking of repeating the same sermon in the same church and to the same people. That isn't what I have in mind at all. I'm referring to using uh, a sermon which you preached in your own church somewhere else when you're invited to preach elsewhere. Uh, with regard to preaching the same sermon in the same church, I, uh, I really find it very difficult to understand how anybody could possibly do that. 
Personally, I should be too self-conscious to do it. But uh, there are men who've done this. Uh, one of my distinguished predecessors, that was Mr. Chapel in London, according to our late organist, who died in 1951, uh, this predecessor of mine preached his famous sermon on Balaam and his ass seven times in Westminster Chapel, <laughs> so much so that the organist could recite it verbatim. <laughs> well, now, I don't think I need say any more about that. But I, I do know that there are men who do this. I was only told the other day, since arriving here, of a very well-known preacher in this country, and he really was a, a very fine preacher. He used to repeat one particular sermon every year when he was a minister here in Philadelphia. And everybody knew he was doing this, and they used to look forward to it. And uh, I've known this being done by request. People have asked the minister to preach a particular sermon, and it has become a kind of annual event. Well, I've nothing to say in favor of this kind of thing. Indeed, I would say a great deal against it. But uh, leaving that out, uh, this question of doing it in the same church, what of the principle involved here? Uh, and as I'm familiar with the history of this matter, there's only one man I know of who uh, took exception to this, and that was Charles Haddon Spurgeon. So we've got to pay some attention to it. And incidentally, in my diatribe on the 19th century yesterday, uh, he is the big exception, of course. Uh, <laughs> otherwise, my remarks on the 19th century still stand. Uh, but uh, he stands out. Now, Spurgeon uh, didn't uh, approve of this idea of repeating sermons. He always tried to prepare a fresh sermon. And yet it's very interesting to read about him that on the first occasion when he visited Scotland and preached in Edinburgh for the first time, adopting his method of preparing a new sermon, it fell completely flat, was a complete failure, and Spurgeon sent an urgent message down to his home in London asking them to send up the notes of the sermon he'd preached in the tabernacle the Sunday before. So you see Spurgeon uh, had to fall back on this in a moment of crisis and of difficulty. Uh, but over and against that uh, isolated view, as far as I'm aware, the whole tendency of other great preachers has been to repeat their sermons. Whitfield, of course, did this constantly. So did John Wesley. You've only to read their journals. And you will see they record that uh, they preached their sermon on such and such a text. And uh, they would do so quite regularly. And a very interesting point about this is that Benjamin Franklin used to say, and you will find it in these diaries and so on of his that are being republished now, that he could always tell when Whitfield was preaching a fresh sermon. He could tell immediately and exactly. And he was generally right. Just by listening, he could tell whether it was something quite new or whether it was a sermon with which Whitfield was familiar. So there you have those two great preachers doing this, and it has been, of course, the custom, as I say, with most preachers to do this. There was a great uh, Welsh preacher who died about 1921. He uh, used to say quite definitely and deliberately that he felt he'd never really preached a sermon properly until he'd preached it at least 20 times. Now, I think that that uh, uh, merits a little examination. I'm not going to do so. We haven't got the time. But... Um, his tendency, I feel, was to become a rhetorician. Uh, but I'm going to elaborate this a little bit later. But th that was his statement. Uh, and I also remember a very good answer that was once given by another great old preacher to somebody who went to him and complained that he had just been listening to this man preaching that sermon for the third time not in the same place, but in different places. There are people who tend to follow preachers round, and uh, they can be a nuisance. Uh, <laughs> however, uh, this man was complaining that he'd heard the sermon for the third time, 
But the wily old preacher looked at him and said, uh, have you put it into practice yet? And the man hesitated to say that. Oh, all right, he said, I'll go on preaching it until you do. <laughs> well, that's a, a satisfactory answer as far as it goes. But is there a real justification for doing this? And I believe there is. And this would be my justification. A sermon, after all, is not just a statement of truth or a statement of a number of truths. It is not, as we've defined it, even an exposition of a passage. It's more than that. Now, if it were only an exposition and stopped at that, well, then I would be ready to grant immediately that uh, the case against repeating it is a very poor one. But if you do accept this notion of the sermon as a message and as a burden and as an entity, a complete message in itself taking this particular form, well, then I think there is a great deal to be said uh, for repeating this sermon in, in various places. And I say it for this reason, that it is surely the experience of every preacher that some messages are given to him in a very special way. I've already referred to that. They come with an unusual clarity. He seems to have been given the order in which the points are to be presented and so on. It seems to be a gift from God. And moreover, because of this character, he finds that this message is honored by the Spirit and is used by the Spirit. There is no question about this at all. Every preacher will testify to this. So I would ask the question, why should they not be repeated? Surely it should be the preacher's concern always to give the best that he's got, the very best that he has. And so it is surely legitimate that he should select his best sermon and uh, preach that to the people. And another argument I would imply is this. If you take the view that I've been trying to put to you of preaching, you will find that sermons grow and develop as the result of being preached. You don't see everything when you're preparing in your study. You'll see more as you're preaching. And your sermon will grow and develop. This is a very interesting point, this. Uh, one which I'm putting before you from my own experience and from what I've known of others. I remember a preacher telling me once about how he was filled with alarm on one occasion. He was a great admirer of another preacher. The first man was a good preacher, but he wasn't uh, an outstanding preacher and a popular preacher in the sense the other man was. But he was a great admirer of the other man. And uh, he said that he'd been to some great uh, synod, and there, were, there was always preaching the last day in these synods, and these great preachers took part. And uh, this man was telling me, he said, to my dismay, I heard him, the old man whom he admired so much, giving out his text, he said. And I really began to feel miserable and ill because he said, I'd heard him preach on that text in my own church, he said, about three months before that. He'd come along uh, after a weekend of preaching. He'd come along on the Monday night. And he said, I felt that he hadn't got much of a sermon. So when I heard him giving out this text on this great occasion, he said, I, I really felt dismayed. But he said, I needn't have felt it. This sermon of his had grown, he said, so much, almost out of recognition. I could recognize the bare scaffolding that we'd had from him on the Monday night in my church. But he said, that's the extraordinary thing about this old man. His sermons grow, he said. They develop in the most amazing manner. He said, mine don't. You see, he was one of these men uh, who prepared meticulously and carefully. And, uh, well, he pre so prepared that they couldn't grow in a sense. He'd, he'd bound them in fetters and irons and chains. But the other men didn't, and his sermons could grow and develop. And this is very true, I think, uh, of preaching. So that, though in a sense you're preaching the same sermon, in many other senses it is not the same sermon. It's a better sermon, and a fuller, and a greater sermon. Uh, not only that. You see, there is again this whole question of the relationship between the sermon and the preaching. I, as I've confessed already, it's a difficult thing to define this, but it's very true. And you will find that when you become 
familiar, really familiar with your sermon, it will greatly improve the effectiveness of your preaching of that sermon. You, there's less of a sense of strain. You're not trying to remember. You're not bound. You've attained a measure of freedom because you're now familiar with it in a way that you cannot be when you preach it for the first time. So that for all these reasons, I would say that uh, to preach the, the same sermon, which you feel is something exceptional as far as you are concerned, which you feel has a real message in it, and which has been blessed and used of God, is something that is thoroughly legitimate. And indeed, it is to the benefit of the people who will be listening to you. But then someone may ask, how often then should you repeat this one sermon? Now here is again a, a somewhat difficult question. Uh, my great and distinguished predecessor, Dr. Campbell Morgan, uh, was quite unashamed about this thing. I remember listening to him on one occasion, and this is how he began. He said, we are told that confession is good for the soul. So I might as well tell you now, he said, before we start, that I am this morning preaching this sermon for the 119th time. Well, the question is, do you approve of that? How many times should you, should you repeat the same sermon? All I would say about it is this. Uh, it's not a question of figures, obviously, or statistics. He was very careful to put down uh, on the envelope in which he kept his notes the number of times he preached the sermon and where. That was good. But as to the number, it's not a mechanical matter. There's only one rule, it seems to me. Stop preaching that sermon when it ceases to grip you, when it ceases to move you, when it ceases to be a means of blessing to you. Stop. Because from there on it'll be mechanical. And indeed it can even become a performance. And I think that's terrible. I once heard a man, sorry to say it was in this country, uh, at a big Bible conference. I think the poor man had been asked to do it. He'd got a great sermon on the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, it was worked out in terms of the letters of the alphabet, starting with A and going through to Z. And naturally it was a somewhat long sermon. <laughs> so that uh, I listened to this, and I must confess that the effect it had upon me was uh, not to uh, bring me to see the glory of the Lord or to be grateful. Uh, I felt that this was approaching the blasphemous. It was rushed through. You see, he had to rush through to get it through in time. He was leaving afterwards, and it was galloped through, and these things were just brought out mechanically. Many people had heard the sermon many times before, and they thought it was wonderful. It was clever, you see. It was a clever sermon, sort of acrostic. And, uh, but uh, to me, this was a sheer performance. And uh, people went away, sort of, uh, admiring the fact that this man's memory was still, still so good, and, and so on. It was certainly not glorifying the Lord. Uh, well, the, we should never give a performance. Uh, we can't reprobate this too strongly. One uh, the other point I would make is this. Certain warnings, if you repeat a sermon elsewhere in this way, there are certain things you've got to avoid. There is the story of a, a very well-known preacher. He was well-known in this country as well as in Great Britain. And he was a man who prepared very carefully. He wrote his sermons and generally read them. Not in a very obtrusive manner. He was very clever at his reading. But he was a man who was very interested in words. He was famous for this. And uh, the story is, and it's said to be true, that uh, on one occasion a certain commercial traveler uh, was visiting the town where this man then ministered and went to hear him on the Sunday morning and thought he'd heard the greatest sermon he'd ever heard in his life. He'd never been in such a service. And what had impressed him particularly was a thing that happened about halfway through the sermon when this great preacher stopped dramatically and said, now, what is the word I want here? Uh, then he mentioned a word. No, it comes near it, but it isn't quite right. Then he took another word. No, not quite right. Took several. And then, ah, here it is. Just the word. 
which brings out the exact shade of meaning. And on he went. Marvellous. Well, this uh, commercial traveller, this commercial traveller was in an entirely different part of the country the next weekend. And uh, he looked at the Saturday evening paper to see who was preaching in the town, and to his great joy and delight, he saw that this great preacher was there at an anniversary service in a certain church. There was no question where he was going. He went and listened to him. And uh, the time came, the text was given, the same text as the previous Sunday. Well, he was a bit taken aback, but uh, he thought it was worth hearing again. And on the sermon went then, halfway through, the dramatic pause. <laughs> what is the word I want? The man got up and went out and said he'd never listen to that man again. Now, you see what I'm saying. If you do repeat a sermon, don't do that sort of thing. This is, this is harmful to preaching. It is dishonest. He knew the word when he asked his question. So you mustn't be dishonest. Now, that is what has done harm to preaching, real harm to preaching. So, when you repeat a sermon, avoid that. I have much greater sympathy with an old preacher whom I actually knew myself. A good old man, did faithful service in his local church. He wasn't much of a preacher. But he was given the great honor, when he was well on in life, of preaching at what they called a quarterly association. This was the height of uh, ambition of many a preacher, and certainly the great honor, greatest honor that could come to them. And uh, he was given this great honor, and as was the custom on those occasions, he was one of two preachers. So the two preachers were together in the pulpit, and during the singing of the hymns, the other men noticed that this old man was scrutinizing the congregation, looking carefully at every person in the various pews. So he whispered to him during one of the hymns, he said, uh, what are you doing? Are you looking to see if there's anybody here was heard your sermon before? No, said the old man. I'm looking to see if there's anybody here who hasn't heard it before. <laughs> well, um, again, you see, again, again, you've got to be, you've got to be careful. If your sermon uh, has been heard by various people, well, don't preach it. Uh, I remember hearing a man the last time I heard him. And as he gave out his text, the minister sitting next to me nudged me, and he said, uh, we're in for an outing tonight. I said, yes, I know where. What? He said, have you heard it as well? I said, I have. I've heard it three times in his own church, uh, and I have also read it several times in the paper that this man edits. The fact was that most people there had already heard the sermon and read it probably more than once. Now, why do men do this sort of thing? Well, the answer, I think, is this. Now, let's be fair about this. Let's be fair about it. Be careful that you don't rush too much and too easily into condemnation, lest you may find yourselves in trouble and your own words will come back to you in the future. Um, there are many reasons for this. One is laziness, of course, and that is never an excuse. That is never an excuse, and I mean, mustn't uh, use that argument. But sometimes it is sheer panic. And... I gathered from the men I've last mentioned that on that particular occasion it was a sort of panic. He said he'd prepared a sermon for this great occasion. It was a great congress. And then he hadn't felt very well over the weekend. And when he went up into the pulpit, he lost his confidence in the sermon that he'd prepared. And in a moment of panic, he'd fallen back upon a masterpiece. I think he was very often guilty of doing that... Uh, very thing. And of course, we can't exclude in this whole matter uh, an element of pride. That a man is more concerned about his own reputation as a preacher than he is about conveying truth to the people. It's a subtle matter, but we must never allow pride uh, to take charge. Uh, so, if you do this, well, keep a record of what you're doing because you'll get one of these experiences that I've been trying to describe. I close this section with a story again about this self-same man to whom I've been referring, who had this bad habit of doing this. A minister was telling me of a big church in the city of Bristol. We were talking about this man, and uh, he said, yes, I had him down, he said, at my anniversary a few years back. 
And he said he came and he gave out his text. Thou therefore my son endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. He said we all thought it was the greatest thing we'd ever heard in our lives. So when next year the question arose as to whom we should have as our anniversary preacher, there was no discussion. This man must have him. So we wrote him, we said he'd come. And he came down the second year, stood up and gave out his text, Thou therefore, my son, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Well, he said it was still very good, and we enjoyed it very much. But uh, because of this, when we came to decide for the next year, there was a good deal of discussion. People said, you know, we shouldn't do that, and... Uh, so on. However, he said after much discussion it was decided we'd give him another chance that every man makes a mistake sometimes. So down he came the third year. Thou therefore, my son, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And at that point, said my friend, we really did begin to feel that we were enduring. So we haven't asked him ever since. All right. Well, you'll find that these points will come back to you when you've been preaching for a number of years. Now, this leads me to say another thing. This question of repeating a sermon leads me to say something which I regard at any rate as extremely interesting, and that is the character of sermons. What do I mean by this? Well, I mean that a sermon tends to have a character of its own. It's a most mysterious thing, this. You've prepared this sermon, you've composed it, yet it seems to have a character of its own. I was very interested when, uh, some little while ago, I had a long conversation with a novelist and he told me exactly the same thing about the characters in his novels and he said you know I have great trouble with them and uh, he couldn't keep them down and they were handling him he felt that his own creations had such character and individuality and personality that they were controlling him instead of him controlling them now it is exactly the same with sermons it's a great mystery to me this but it's a very definite fact. And you'll find that some sermons virtually preach themselves. You've got very little to do. They'll preach themselves. They'll never let you down. That is true of some sermons. But there are others, and I can't tell you the difference between them, which require very careful handling. And unless you do handle them carefully, they'll half murder you. I've known sermons that have almost killed me in the introduction. Uh, and it's taken me a long time to so understand them as to know how to handle myself and to prevent their handling me over much. In other words, there are sermons that tend to run away with you in your, in your introduction so that when you come to what is really important and when, especially when you come to the climax, you're already tired out and exhausted. Now, this is the character of the sermon. And you've got to know your sermon. And uh, it, it's a, a point of great value. I remember an old preacher, uh, I just remember him at the end of his life when I was very young. He always compared sermons to horses. You see, he had ridden a lot in his youth. He was a farmer's son and so on. And he invariably, in talking about sermons, he'd tell you how he'd had a bad time preaching at some anniversary over the weekend. He said, you know, that old sermon of mine, it threw me. I thought it would. And, and, and there he was lying on the ground. The sermon had thrown him. A horse, you see. Well, there, there's great point in all this. And to me, it's a very fascinating point. So, my advice is, get to know your sermons. Uh, and you'll know the right sermon for the right occasion. You'll know the right sermon for any particular physical state or condition that you may be in yourself. All these factors come in, and it's quite astonishing. It may sound to you most unspiritual to talk like this, but I'm assuring you that you'll find that it is of great practical importance. Very well. That's the question of repeating summons. I hesitated whether I deal with this next point at all. Preaching other people's summons. I felt I've just got to bring it in because I gather that this is something that is done. What do we say about this? Well, I've only one comment to make about this. This is utterly dishonest unless you acknowledge what you're doing. I never have understood how a man can live with himself who does this. He, he receives the praise and the thanks of people and he knows that it isn't due to him. He's a thief. He's a robber. He's a sinner. But the amazing thing to me is how can he possibly live with himself and do this sort of thing? <laughs> 
Now, there are some odd aspects to this matter, which uh, I felt would be of interest to you. I wonder if you've ever heard of the famous story of Spurgeon and uh, the student in his college that was brought to him on one occasion. This was the story. This young man had been preaching in different churches on Sundays, and uh, the reports had been coming back, some saying that it was wonderful and it was very good, but adverse criticisms began to come to the effect that this young man was preaching a sermon of Mr. Spurgeon's. Now, the principal of the college, of course, had to deal with this, so he sent for the young man and he said, Look here, I hear that you're going round and preaching one of Mr. Spurgeon's sermons. Is this true? And the young man said, No, it's not true. Well, he was pressed, but he still persisted in saying that it was not true. Well, this went on and on, and at last the principal felt that he must take the young men to Mr. Spurgeon himself. So they went in together, and then this case was put before him. Well, now, said Mr. Spurgeon, you needn't be frightened, he said. If you are honest, you, you won't be punished. We, we all are sinners, but, now we, but we do want to get the facts. You have been preaching a sermon on such and such a text. Yes, sir. And you have divided it up as follows. Yes, sir. And yet you say that you have not been preaching my sermon. That's my position, sir. Well, this went on for some time. And at last Mr. Spurgeon was really beginning to get a bit uh, heated about this. So he said to the young man, Well, are you saying then that it's your sermon? Oh, no, sir, he said. Well, whose sermon is it? He said, It's a sermon of William J. of Bath. The, the, there was a famous preacher in Bath at the early part of last century. His sermons were printed in two volumes. He said it, it was the sermon of William J. of Bath. Wait a minute, said Spurgeon. He went to his library, pulled out one of the volumes. There was the sermon. The exact sermon. The same text, same headings, same everything. What had happened? Well, Mr. Spurgeon had preached it also. And <laughs> but Mr. Spurgeon's statement was that it was many years since he had read the two volumes and had forgotten all about it. He could say quite honestly that he was not aware of the fact that when he preached that sermon, he was preaching one of the sermons of William J. of Bath. Well, all right, that, I say that as a little concession to you. Um, <laughs> then there is another very good story, I think. I say this for the comfort of a man in need, a man in desperation, or a lay preacher particularly. It's another story about Spurgeon, who was given to fits of depression. He suffered from gout, and that always is accompanied by an element of depression. And he was under the clouds and felt that he couldn't preach, and indeed that he wasn't fit to preach. And uh, he refused to preach the following Sunday, and went off to the country to his old home in Essex. And on Sunday morning he slipped in at the back in the little chapel where he'd been brought up. And there was a lay preacher preaching that morning. And the poor lay preacher proceeded to preach one of Mr. Spurgeon's sermons. The moment the men had finished, Spurgeon rushed on to him, with tears streaming down his face, thanking him profusely. And the poor man said, Mr. Spurgeon, he said, I don't know how to face you. I've just been preaching one of your sermons. He said, I don't care whose sermon it is. He said, your preaching this morning has convinced me that I am a child of God that I am saved by grace, that I'm called to the ministry, and I'm ready to go back to preach again. His own sermon, through the lips and the mouth and the tongue of the lay preacher, had done that for him. Well, that is about, I think, the only justification for doing this sort of thing. <laughs> so let me, let me warn you, let me warn you, let me warn you against doing this. You see, if you do this sort of thing, you may have that experience of that lay preacher. Uh, there was a man in, in Grand Rapids here. I once crossed the Atlantic with him of the name of Mel Trotter. He, uh, he w ran one of these refuges, I think they're called, kind of mission refuge hall in Grand Rapids. He told me the story himself, how he'd been working very hard. He was a practical man and an evangelist and so on, and he hadn't had time to prepare properly for the Sunday. He'd got his Sunday evening sermon, but he couldn't get his Sunday morning sermon, and he'd had to go to bed on Saturday night without a Sunday morning sermon. And uh, he got up very early Sunday morning. Nothing would come at all, and he didn't know what to do. At last, in desperation, he decided he'd have to preach one of Dr. Campbell Morgan's sermons. 
So he went into the pulpit and started the service. As they were finishing the hymn before the sermon, the door at the back opened and in walked Campbell Morgan and sat at the back. Very well, you, you may get that sort of thing. As a matter of fact, whether it will interest you or not, I don't know. I once, in the year 1936, the second Sunday in August, I was on holiday in the west of Wales with my wife. There was no alternative but to go to the Anglican church, and we went there with a the farmer and his wife with whom we were staying, and um, we sat down, and eventually the men went up into the pulpit to preach his sermon, and he gave out his text. And my wife nudged me, uh, because that was actually the first text on which I'd ever preached in Westminster Chapel, my first visitor. And because of that, I suppose, and was a, because I was a stranger, it had been printed in two or three journals. And my wife had read these and knew the sermon as the result fairly well. The man gave out this text. And then he began to preach. I'm sorry to say he attempted to preach my sermon. And there was I listening to him. He didn't know me, you see. He'd never seen me before. But I was actually there, and he had to meet me during the week that followed. Well, this is what you're exposing yourself to. I'm trying to frighten you and to put you off. Another thing, my wife was a witness of this. Two preachers came on two successive Sundays to preach in the chapel of which she was a member and preached the identical same sermon. <laughs> the question was, which of them was the author? The probable answer was neither, <laughs> but they both borrowed it. But that is how you're caught out, you see. And let me tell you this, changing the text isn't enough. Any, discri any discriminating listener will always be able to tell what you're doing. Uh, another thing, adding a few of your own illustrations doesn't cover it either. Or I once heard a man saying that his method was, he would read a, Spur a Spurgeon sermon, he said, three or four times. Then he'd put it down and not read it again. And then he'd preach. You see, he said, I, I, I'm not preaching Spurgeon's sermon. It had passed through my mind. Yes, <laughs> like a sort of condit. It was the kind of mind he had. <laughs> Things did pass through them, and there was very little that remained and originality. Very well. Let me say just a final word about this. If you must preach somebody else's sermon, if you are really in desperation on some occasion, and you feel there's nothing else to do for the sake of your people, well, don't do what a poor preacher whom I knew once in South Wales, and I think I'm probably speaking the literal truth when I say that he probably never went outside Wales at all, not even to England, leave alone anywhere else. He got up in his pulpit one Sunday morning and gave out his text, and then he began with these words. As I stood the other day at the head of the Wyoming Valley, <laughs> All right. In other words, leave that sort of thing out. <laughs> and if, my, if this uh, clergyman who preached my sermon that had a little sense, he would not have started with my first sentence. He actually did. I still remember it because he fixed it in my mind. He said, a very good subject for discussion in a church fellowship meeting. He never had a church fellowship meeting. I did. And so I naturally introduced my subject like that. Well, this is, you see, how you give the game away. Avoid things like that if you, if you feel at any time that you must do this. Now let me hurry on to something much more important. The romance of preaching. The romance of preaching. There's nothing like it. It is the greatest work in the world. The most thrilling, the most exciting, the most rewarding, the most wonderful. I know of nothing which is comparable to that which one feels when one walks up the steps of one's pulpit with a fresh sermon on a Sunday morning or a Sunday evening, when you feel you've got a message from God and you're longing to give it. This is something that one can't describe. Repeating your best sermon somewhere else never gives you that. That's why... I am such an advocate of a regular and a longish ministry in the same place. And that is something I fear that I shall never know again, having retired from the pastoral ministry. But th there is nothing equal to that. Uh, you can have 
a very happy time in preaching elsewhere, as I say. But just this, somehow or another, the relationship between you and the people and your preparation and all the rest of it, it is a most glorious feeling. But another aspect of this romantic element, the endless possibilities of a service, or if you prefer it, the uncertainty of a service. There's something glorious even about the uncertainty. Because if you're a true preacher, you really do not know what's going to happen when you enter a pulpit. If you're a lecturer, as I've told you, you do. But if you're a preacher, you certainly don't. And you'll get the most amazing experiences. I even put this under the head of romance. You may enter the pulpit feeling really well, confident in your preparation and all the rest of it, and you'll have a bad service. Something wonderful even in that. It shows you, at any rate, that you are not the sole person in control. You've tended to think you were. You've discovered you're not. And it reminds you that you're under God. But you see, conversely, and this is the wonderful thing, you may enter that pulpit feeling ill, feeling nervous, feeling that you haven't got much. And suddenly, all will be well. Even physically. The effect of preaching upon one's own health is quite remarkable. Those of you who've read the journals of Whitfield will have noticed that he often said this sort of thing. He hadn't been feeling well. Probably it was his heart troubling him a bit and he was too heavy and so on. And he would put down in his journal or in a letter to somebody, I shan't be right again until I've had a good pulpit sweat. <laughs> and it used to put him right. A good pulpit sweat. Uh, I've often said to people that uh, most uh, Turkish paths that I've had have been in pulpits. <laughs> but this is something that literally happens. You're completely reinvigorated and restored to health and strength, and you scarcely know yourself. That is what is so marvelous about this. I don't know anything else that does this, that you may enter your pulpit like that and come out entirely different. Now, I want to add one qualification to this, and this is a point that has interested me very much throughout the years. There are times when I could tell on a Saturday what was going to happen on the Sunday. I'm only saying that this is times, and this is how I put it to you. When you yourself are gripped and are moved in the preparation you will generally find that the same happens in the preaching. Now, I'm saying when you're gripped and moved, not when you've composed well. I'm not saying that. I say when you've been gripped and moved, when it is, as it were, you, the very thing you are preparing is coming to you yourself and doing something to you, that is going to do something to the people. And whenever I've had that, I have generally known what was going to happen on the Sunday. And it generally did happen. And again, this under this heading of romance, I want to mention once more the thing I've been referring to earlier this afternoon about this theme developing while you're preaching. Uh, a theme growing, a sermon growing, even while you're speaking, and opening out for you in a way that it didn't do when you were in your study. It's an extraordinary thing, this. Uh, one has no control over it, it just happens. And I have often found this, that I've gone into the pulpit with a prepared sermon, but while I've been preaching, my first point alone would obviously become a whole sermon. And then I would go out of the sermon, out of the pulpit, realizing that I'd got a series of sermons which I hadn't seen before that my remaining points became a series. I hadn't seen this in my preparation, but while preaching this sermon, I did see it. And again, I put this under the heading of romance, because, you see, while this sort of thing happens, you'll never be short of matter, you'll never be short of a sermon. In, in fact, you'll get to the point in which you'll be longing for the next Sunday, looking forward to it eagerly. I'm speaking out of sheer experience and to the glory of God. Because this sort of thing has happened to me so often in the pulpit. I've seen several weeks ahead like that given to me. 
out of my own sermon in a way that I'd never anticipated. So that is again another element of this romance. And here is another one. It's a part of the one I've just been saying. There have been times when I have felt that uh, I have been restrained from preaching the whole of my prepared sermon. It's been developed and worked out in this way and opened out before me so that I may go out of the pulpit, as I say, having only preached uh, a quarter or a sixth of, the sum, of, of this series, or sometimes, and I'm thinking of one particular occasion, when I went out to the pulpit having only preached half my sermon, half my prepared sermon. And I couldn't quite understand this, on this particular occasion to which I'm referring. But however, it had happened. And so, in a sense, I was ready for the next Sunday, next Sunday morning. And the next Sunday morning came, and I preached the remainder of my original sermon, which was now a sermon in and of itself, and was given an usual liberty with it. And a man came to me at the end and told me that there was a visitor there who would like to see me, seemed to be a minister, he said. And eventually I saw this minister who traveled a very long way and was there that morning and who was so moved that he could scarcely speak. What had happened? Well, what had happened, you see, was this. This man was quite certain that God had brought him there all that distance to hear this particular sermon. I think I've said this in, a, in the foreword to a little book, but it's worth repeating. And I'm sure he was right. But this is the thing that astounded me. If I had not been dealt with the previous Sunday, it was my intention to give the previous Sunday what this man was hearing this Sunday. But I was restrained. I was only allowed to preach half my sermon the previous Sunday. The second half had been kept back. And as I say, I was a little bit disturbed about this. But afterwards, of course, it was perfectly clear. You don't control this. This is God. This is where the romance comes in. You've no idea what you're doing. I've never heard of this man. Never seen him. Knew nothing at all about him. But there it was. Is there anything comparable to this? Is there anything as romantic as this? Well, this is the sort of thing that you get and you will get. And the more you get it, the more you'll be amazed at it. And the more you'll wonder at this whole matter of preaching and this act of preaching in particular. Well, somebody may ask me on the practical level, how do you, what do you do then when you suddenly find while well, you're preaching that this is happening? Well, what you do is, you see, and you're unable to do it, you have to think very quickly, and you see that you've got to round off this sermon you're actually preaching. You've got to make it an entity in itself. You'll have to rearrange. You may have to rearrange your points, or you'll see how this is opening out, and you bring it to a conclusion. You don't, you don't leave it unfinished, as it were. You've got to rearrange in order to secure this entity, this completion. But it is, as I say, an extraordinary thing. And then another element of this romance of preaching is this. You never know who's going to be listening to you. And you never know what's going to happen to people who are listening to you. It may be the turning point in somebody's life. Thank God it is, not infrequently. The fools who came to scoff remain to pray. Men who may have come in in utter hopelessness go out rejoicing. Converted. Regenerated. New men and women. The whole life changed. And you've been involved in this. Is there anything in the world that compares with this? There is nothing, nothing at all. This is the most wonderful thing that can ever happen. You are between a soul and God, and eternal matters are being dealt with, and eternal destinies are determined. Conversion. Oh, yet then you'll get this much more often. The people will come to you at the end and say, you know, this is astonishing. If you'd known our position, you could not have preached more directly to it. It's the very thing they needed. Some problem, some perplexity, some difficulty, some tragedy. And you'd been given the very words that were necessary. I know of a man 
He was a very fine pastor in another country, and he'd been persecuted and he had to leave, and he'd intended settling in another country, but they were passing through London, happened to come to our service on a Sunday morning. I'd never heard of them, knew nothing about them. But I was led to say something, and it was a sharp part of the exposition. This man turned to his wife at the end, and she turned to him. And they said, that's our answer. And the answer was that they were not to go to settle into this new country. They were to go back to the country where they'd received persecution, and to face it out, and to battle it out. And they did, and they were honored in doing so. I knew nothing about this until they told me several years afterwards. But this is the wonderful thing. Let me end by telling you perhaps the most uh, striking example of all this that I have ever been privileged to know. This was actually in a prayer, not even in a sermon. There was a poor man I knew. He, I'd known his conversion from a terrible life of sin, and he'd become a fine Christian. This was when I was in South Wales. But uh, afterwards, unfortunately, for various reasons, this poor fellow had become a backslider and had fallen very deeply into sin. He'd uh, run away from his wife and children with another woman, and she was a poor type, and they'd come to London, and uh, there they'd lived in sin, and he'd squandered the money, and he'd actually gone home and told his wife a lie in order to get further money out of her, the house was in their joint names. He got this change that it was all in his name. Then he sold it in order to get the money. You see, he'd gone very, very far into the far country. He'd sinned terribly. And now the money had finished. And the woman had deserted him. And he solemnly decided that he was going to commit suicide. He felt that God would forgive him. But he couldn't forgive himself. And he felt that he had no right ever to approach his family again. So he solemnly decided to walk over Westminster Bridge and throw himself into the Thames and die. And he was proceeding to do this. Some of you may have been in London. As you approach Westminster Bridge, Big Ben, the clock of the Houses of Parliament is there. Big Ben struck half past six, six thirty. Suddenly it flashed into his mind. He, referring to me, will now be just entering his pulpit for his evening service. So he decided that he'd come and listen to me once more before he put an end to himself. He made his way to the chapel. It wasn't far. Got in through the front door, was walked up the stairs. He was just entering the gallery when he heard these words. God, have mercy upon the backslider. Literally the first words he heard. Everything was put right. He was not only restored, he became an elder in his church and a man who rendered great and wonderful service. What's it mean? It means this. We are in the hands of God. Anything can happen with God. Nothing is impossible. Ask great things of God, as William Carey said, but go on. Expect great things from God, and he'll lead you on from surprise to surprise. There is no romance comparable to that of the work of the preacher. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.